When we think about an item in our heads, it's very simple. It is a single object, a singular concept, and it's tangible. This is why creating items in games is so difficult. Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about items, and yes, I will be showing you how to make full, complete items like the ones that you're seeing right here in this demo scene. But beyond that, I'm going to be showing you my architecture for creating a validation system that automatically manages all of your items. Now why is this important? Take this game that I've been working on, it has over 100 items. We can't rely on manually checking that we've set every single item up correctly. We want all of our items to be automatically validated so that it's actually impossible for us to set them up incorrectly. That means as a solo dev, you can create hundreds of items and have them all automatically managed and validated. So let's get started. All right, so I'm in Unity where I have this little open world template project. If you guys would like to download this, I have a link where it's freely available on my GitHub. But if you have your own project, that's totally fine. Don't worry. There is nothing special in here that you need. Let's begin with making the most fundamental component of our items. This is going to be a script named base item. A quick reminder to you guys, all of this source code is available on my GitHub from the link below. So you can either pause and write it yourself or feel free to just sit back and listen and copy it at the end if you prefer to learn that way, since I am gonna go a bit fast. I've included a namespace open world template here. I think it's important for me to use a namespace in this case because the class name base item is a very common generic name. And by including a namespace, I'm avoiding namespace conflicts. So I would suggest including one, but of course, feel free to use a different namespace than open world template. We're gonna take advantage of something called a scriptable object in Unity. To do that, change mono behavior to scriptable object. This line creates a menu in the Unity editor so that we can create a new item. Then I'm gonna fill in some of the primary details that we would need for an item. Things like an item ID, where we use a GUID to ensure it is a unique ID, uh, a base name, a display name, and a description. Also, if your IDE isn't recognizing the GUID, uh, make sure that you've added using system at the top. Now I would like to assign an item rarity to any item. To do that, I create an item rarity enum and fill in several different rarity tiers. Now I create some values pretty much uh, every single item in our game will need to have. Things like item rarity, how many items can stack in your inventory, and a cell value. Finally, we also want to include a reference to some assets that make up the item, our world item prefab, or the 3D object that represents the item, and an item sprite that will be our icon. To me, these are some of the most common elements that compose an item. Of course, feel free to add you know, more to your base item if you think your game needs them. Save that, and back in Unity, let's make a folder of our scriptable objects, and a folder inside there for items. We then go create, open world template, items, and then click the item. And there you go, you have now created your first scriptable object in the project. Scriptable objects are really cool in Unity because it allows you to edit values in the editor in real time without recompiling your c -sharp assembly. This means that we can change these values while the game is running and play around with them until we dial in those parameters just right. And that is the main reason that you should use scriptable objects, in my opinion, for items. So let's fill this in now. I'm naming our item logs normal, and you'll notice that we have an item ID that's been automatically initialized for us. Now we simply fill in the base name and all of the descriptions that we want. I'm gonna choose an item of rarity common, a max stack of 50, and a cell value of five. So we got a problem now. We don't have a 3D object or a prefab for our item, and we're also gonna need an icon. I'm gonna give you guys a free mini item pack. If you want them, come on over to my Patreon. You can find that link in the description. You're gonna click on this Unity package file here and just download it. And real quick, y'all, part of who I am and what this channel represents is I'll always be giving away my assets for free. If you guys are able to, please consider joining my Patreon. The tiers just start at $3 or consider becoming a YouTube member. I like many of these amazing people right here who help support me. 
So the thing we downloaded is just a file. You can drag it straight into your project and it will automatically unpack. Inside this folder, we have five icons, five 3D models, and a couple universal textures. Let's create our first item. So drag the logs onto our scene and you can see how they look in play mode. Some pretty normal looking logs, I'd say. But obviously we need a way to connect our scriptable object item to this world item. And this is where the abstract concept of an item comes into play. We're gonna have both a base item and a world item class, which I'm creating now. So the base item contains our item's shared data, or maybe you could think of this as static data. Shared data should be data that is the same between all instances of a certain item. For example, all logs should be named logs. That's easy. An example of something that is not static and will vary from instance to instance should be part of our world item. An example of this would be our item count. Like if we picked up 10 logs, our item count would be 10. So let's open up the world item now uh, that I've explained this kind of structure. So again, I'm adding the namespace open world template to this file. Next, I add that instance data I was just talking about. First, it's the base item to tell us what kind of item our world item is. Then we also add in item count. The last thing I'm adding here is an on trigger event. And I'll make it print a statement just so we can see our player interacting with the items in the world. All right, so we're back in Unity and let's create our first item, but with one exception. I'm gonna do it the hard way first. Then I'll show you some validation tricks that we can use to immensely speed this process up. First off, add the world item script. Now we gotta drag the scriptable object onto our item data asset and set the item count. We'll also need a rigid body and the default should be good here, but I'm gonna actually check this is kinematic box. This is something I don't want to actually check, but I'm just gonna pretend that I made a mistake here um, and we're gonna use validation later to fix it automatically. So yeah, let's just pretend I did this accidentally and check this box. Let's also add a box collider and the default is looking pretty good there. It's also a good idea to have an items layer, so I'll go up here and create a layer named item, then I'll assign our logs to the item layer. This is optional, but I think it puts a really nice polish on uh, in-game items. There's this free asset on the asset store named Quick Outline. It will use a shader to apply an outline to any object in your game. So add it to your assets, and then you can open up in the package manager and install it. So you should have this quick outline folder, and now we can just add a component and type outline to add it. I'm gonna customize it a bit, changing the color alpha and the width, uh, and unfortunately we do need to go into play mode to see the effect take place. So you guys can see this little outline around the item now. A lot of games do this to distinguish that it is an interactable item and not part of the environment. So this is just a really easy way to polish up your game. That was a ton of work to be honest, uh, but we can finalize our logs now. So completely unpack your prefab, then let's make an items folder in our prefabs folder and drag the logs in there. Then the very last thing to do is go back to our scriptable object and now drag in the world item prefab and we can also select an icon from the item pack icons. And congrats y'all, we have officially finished our first item. Now let's talk validation. So what is validation or specifically data validation? Well, we can essentially build in a series of checks and scripts to ensure that our items build in a very specific way. Not only is this useful for rapidly creating dozens of items, it also ensures that you didn't make any mistakes when making them. When you're creating hundreds of items in a game, you don't have time to make sure every little box is checked, component is added, or specific variables aren't null. There is a way to do all this automatically, and it's called data validation. So let's head into our world item script to see that in action. All right, so at the bottom here, we add in this built-in method named onValidate. onValidate runs by default every time this script is loaded or a value on it is changed. And remember, it's an editor only function. That's why I've added this Unity Editor syntax. If you don't include this, your game will only run in the Unity Editor and it will error when you try to build. Let's start with a simple check. We check if our item dataset is null, and if it is, we just log a message telling us that it is null. This will be really convenient so that we don't accidentally forget to hook the base item to our world item. 
The next check I'm going to add is uh, if our rigid body is kinematic property is set to false. If it isn't, then we automatically set it to false. The next one is just ensuring our world item is on the item layer, and if it isn't, we set it to the right layer. I'm also going to validate our outline so we don't have to keep manually setting the values. So I'm setting the outline mode, color, and thickness all here. Here's the last thing to add to our world item, and it's all the way at the top. So we can require certain components to be attached to our game objects using this line. So I'm going to require an outline, a rigid body, and a box collider component. These components should now all get added automatically. Now back in Unity, let's go ahead and create our second item and see this in action. Let's get the planks from our item pack and you know, pretty much we just have to do one thing now. Select your planks, then add a world item component and boom, everything has been added automatically and set to the proper values for us. And what's even crazier is remember how our is kinematic box was checked accidentally for our logs before? Well, if we go back and look now, we'll find that it is properly unchecked. This is because the data validation ran on that item and automatically found a mismatch in the rigid body's is kinematic property. So not only is this saving us a ton of time, but it's also fixing our mistakes. So basically the only thing that we gotta do here for our planks is fill in the item data asset, but you know, first we do have to make one of those. So create a new base item, scriptable object, name planks, fill out all that juicy data up to the prefab. Then let's go back to our planks game object and unpack it completely. Now you'll actually notice in the console that it is telling us that our item data asset is null. So, you know, let's make sure that we do connect our scriptable object to our world item to clear that issue. Finally, drag our new planks prefab into our prefab folder. And back in the plank scriptable object, we can now connect the rest of the data, like the world item prefab and the sprite icon. And that's it, we're done with this item. All right, and there's just one last thing I wanna show you guys in terms of item validation. If I go into one of the items right now and I accidentally, or in this case, purposefully, delete my item ID, it currently just sits empty, which is bad. So we can add in some more validation checks to ensure that this never happens. Open up your base item script and we're gonna add in uh, an onValidate method here as well. And you also might notice I've listed this as a public virtual function. The reason for this is that we might want to inherit from this class or make a derived class that extends the base item class. For example, if you made like a weapon, which I'm actually going to show you guys in just a sec. Okay, so what we can do here is we can check our item ID string and we make a check if it's null or empty. There are other checks from the GUID class that can be useful as well, like checking if the GUID is empty. If our string is empty, then we go ahead and automatically just create a new one. This will ensure that we always have a valid ID for our item. Now, there are a lot of other useful checks that you could imagine making, but I'll just show one more that I think is pretty cool. So using the prefab utility class, you can actually check if a game object is part of a prefab or a game object in the hierarchy. Okay, we're done here. So back in the editor, you can now see that if I delete my ID, it automatically generates a new one and we're good to go. At this point, you might be wondering, what if I wanna make a more complex item like a weapon or a structure? Won't that have additional data like attack bonus, damage, etc.? And you're exactly right. Uh, this does not fit our base item mold. But this is a perfect opportunity to use inheritance or create a derived class. So let's create a new script named weapon. Open that up, make sure to add a namespace since weapon is a very generic name. And now, you know, how do we make uh, our weapon class derived from base item? Well, it's really simple. So right now we're just actually inheriting from mono behavior. So instead we just swap this out for our base item class. I want the weapon to show up as a different scriptable object in our context menu. So I create a weapon category in our items dropdown. Then I'm just gonna cook up a few common parameters here. In terms of assets, it's very common that you will want a separate prefab uh, for the object that your character is actually holding. So I make an item held prefab here. Then also adding just some more generic data like uh, base damage and crit damage and a couple others. 
Now let's go back to Unity, right click in our items folder, and this time we choose weapon instead of item. Now this is the power of inheritance. We can see all of our base items data, but in addition to that, our weapon data has been added. I did include one item that is more like a weapon. It's gonna be the steel ax model. So I'll go ahead and fill in this data and I'll even assign the item rarity to rare instead of common, whoa. Then of course we gotta add our model to the scene. In the hierarchy, we add our world item class to the steel ax. Again, everything has been automatically added and set, except we do need to drag in our base item scriptable object into the item data asset. Then we create the prefab, fill in the prefab and icon data, and now we arrive at the weapon data section. So I've listed this item held prefab as a separate prefab. I'm not gonna get into too much detail here, but a good way to proceed with this is to create a prefab variant from your world item prefab. And potentially you'll want to remove like the world item class from it and maybe some of the other associated components, just keeping the actual mesh itself. Of course, how you proceed from here is dependent on your game and your implementation of weapons. Then I'll just fill in some random numbers and we're done with our first weapon. So now you guys have seen the process for creating items and weapons. I'm gonna create the remaining two items from the item pack here, but I'm just gonna speed it up. So. Once you get these steps down, I would say the whole process takes as little as 30 seconds or so per item. So you can scale to and manage hundreds of items in your game in you know, just minutes if you have all the assets together, uh, even as a solo dev using these methods. So we're basically at the end, but let me give you a final tip or two. If you have a player and you want to interact with these items, here's what I do. First of all, I go into my project settings, physics, then I turn off physics interactions between the actual player layer and the item layer. This allows you to freely run through the items, which is how most games would do it. Then I go to my player and add some kind of interacting game object. I'll add a rigid body and a capsule collider here, then make sure to check is kinematic on the rigid body and is trigger on the capsule collider. Now remember we added the print statement for our on trigger enter in our world item class. So this should print out every time that we overlap an item in game. Okay guys, at this point, we're ready for our final demo. So let's go check that out. So you can see that we've set up a scene here with five items in our world. One of those is a weapon which has extended data from our base item class. When we walk over these items, we do see in the console that it is printing out properly the correct item and even the interacting game object, which in this case is our player. Did you guys find that tutorial helpful? If you did, hit that subscribe button and like button to boost me into the good algorithm universe. And I'll see you next time. Peace.